morning. morning. All right, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and head over to Hebrews. We're in chapter 26 this morning. I mean, excuse me, 10, looking at verse 26. Scared everybody to death on that one, even myself when I realized I said it. Uh, 10, 26 through 31 is where we'll be uh, today. I want to relate. Now, we all have uh, hair-raising stories, every one of us, I know. I've asked you, and you've, we've talked, and we've shared different stories along the way. Uh, those times where we were terrified something happened or whatever. And I'm going to share one of my own, and I apologize for those of you who've heard this one before, but I'm going to go ahead and share it. Uh, this was when I was about 19 years old, 18, 19, right in that ballpark. And it was, I was living in my first home away from home. I got an old farmhouse out in the country that they let me move into. And I moved into it all, uh, by myself. And I'm out there. And on this particular night, it was over in the San Jose, rural, rural San Jose area out in the middle of nowhere. Tornado Alley to boot. And I'm out there. And I happened that night to watch a show that I shouldn't have watched, but I wasn't right with the Lord. It was one of those uh, very real-to-life stories, uh, real evil, satanic evil in the story. I'm not going to name the, the show, but I watched it. And I, I remember finishing the night. It was getting late, and I'm getting ready for bed. And I'm just in my heart. I'm just, you know, all rattled by watching this show. And I go into bed, and I lay on the bed, and right there next to where the head of the bed is, there's a window. It sits right here. And I'm laying in the bed, and I'm, I'm just trying to get to sleep. And about there, and all of a sudden I hear <coughs> just coughing. That clear. And I'm like, oh, wow. <laughs> I'm like, did I really hear that? Did I really hear it? And I kind of shook it off, and I'm like, I didn't really hear that. And then I hear it again. <coughs> Just like that, like a croup. I'm like, oh my. That was a cough. <laughs> and uh, so I, I'm, I'm in bed, and I'm like, I got to get up. And here's the weird thing. I have two Doberman pincers in my house. And they're they're full grown. These, these are beautiful i mean these are could be killers you know <laughs> and they're not doing anything they're not they're not barking they're not doing anything and uh, i'm like this is too weird and then i hear the cough again and i realize i got to get out of bed so i rolled out of bed and i'm kind of i'm freaked out and i roll out of bed and i get up against the wall and literally glued to the wall and I'm moving through the house and long, long, because I didn't want them to see me, you know? And I got to my closet and I got my shotgun and I moved through the house and I get into the kitchen, I go over to the door and I'm going out because I could hear where the cough was. It's right outside that window where I'm at. And it's like in a corner. And so I'm going around the house and I ease in along here and I get about there. <laughs> and I'm like, oh my, <laughs> is he there? You know, they're there. And uh, so I come around the corner and I jump out with that gun and I jump right up like this. And when I round the corner, out of the blackness comes a 300 plus pound sow hog. <laughs> Run right at me! And that hog was more scared than I was. But I about shot the hog, the house, everything. <laughs> But it terrified me. It was one of those memories, those stories, you just never get past it. The people who owned the place, they kept hogs there. She had got loose, moved up by the house to stay warm along the, the, the foundation. And she's coughing right outside my window. But anyhow, she scared me to death, especially in light of the movie that I had just watched. But scary experiences, we've all had them car accidents, you name it, whatever it might be, we've all had those hair-raising stories. But I want to tell you this. There is an experience coming. And I, for, I should say for, and I fear uh, for many believers that will make even the most scary 
moment of our lives pale in comparison. Not may it be you, but others, those who will face this. And that event is to stand before our God, the living God, in a state of ongoing willful sin, to come before him in judgment, to be judged as a believer. We're told it will be a terrifying experience. And I want to read the text, chapter 10, 26 through 31. For if we go on sinning willfully, after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a terrifying expectation of judgment and the fury of a fire which will consume the adversaries. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much severer punishment do you think he will deserve who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has regarded as unclean the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has insulted the spirit of grace? For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Now I want to tell you this. Right at the outset, this is one of the most sobering passages in all the Word of God to me. It's this one here is tough. And it should be tough for all of us. You can see it, 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 it's scary when we look at what's here. But it does, it's not how it has to be. You need to understand that or how it will be. But for some it will be. For some it will be. What we learn here in these verses is this. Willful sin. Willful sin on the part of a believer is a very serious issue. That will be met with very serious consequences. Willful sin on the part of the believer is a very serious issue. That will be met with very serious consequences. We see this truth now unfolded in the fourth warning passage of Hebrews. This is the fourth major warning text of the letter which we'll consider in three parts, okay? We're going to see this truth unfolded in three parts. So with that, we're going to go ahead here and get started by looking at the warning itself. The warning itself will be the first thing we consider. The warning, verses 26 and 27. For if we go on sinning willfully after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a terrifying expectation of judgment and the fury of a fire which, de which will consume the adversaries. This is a terrible warning. What's here? And as with all of the warnings of Hebrews, these, the passages, there's controversy. There is. We've addressed a lot of this at the very outset of the letter. You know, I've told you the various takes on the warning passages because they make up such a portion of the letter. There's six major warnings that take place in the letter. And we've discussed that. But this one here uh, really, really... Uh, uh, has created a lot of controversy for how powerful it is. Uh, the, 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 the language we'll get into in a moment. But it's a matter of interpretation, specifically as it relates to who the author has in mind as to the target of the warning. Who is he actually warning? Who is he talking to this way? Is he talking to... To believers? Is he talking to us? 
Or who's he talking to here? And that's been the controversy. As stated throughout, as I said, the study, there are basically three schools of thought on these warning passages when you read them. The first one is believers. They're believers who lose their salvation. They're believers who lose their salvation. Now, obviously, we have a problem with that. We, the scriptures do not uh, allow for that. The clear teaching of scripture. We're told that if we trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, we have eternal life. For John 3, 16 and other passages. John 10 says no one plucks them out of the Father's hand. Romans chapter 8, 35 and following. Uh, it tells us not, there isn't anything that could separate us from the love of God. So we know that it's not people who lose their salvation. However, if you're going to deal the most honestly with the language, if there's not something more in view here, that's actually allowing the scriptures to speak to, uh, or at least to say what it says, you, you'd almost have to take it that way if you didn't have the clear teaching of all the other passages that tell us otherwise. So there's more here. That's what we've determined in our study. Second school of, of thought is this. And this is, by the way, taken by many, 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 many scholars and, and in our evangelical community take this position. And that is this. These are unbelievers. These are apostates who were once professors of Christ, having been intellectually convinced, yet in reality unconverted. Let me say that again. Basically what we're saying is, is they are professors and not possessors. So who he's talking to here are not believers. This is a position that's taken, as I said, by many, many people, pastors, commentators, and others, even in our evangelical ranks, uh, they take this position that that's who's in view here. The third school of thought is this. Th this warning passage, as with all the warning passages, are to believers. He's talking to believers. Those believers in danger of apostasy, of turning away and going back or to something other than Christ. And they face a very severe consequence for such actions. And therefore, the warning. The warning is to us. He's speaking to believers and he's saying, if you sin willfully after you've trusted Christ, you got a problem. If you go on sinning willfully, there are serious consequences for that. And we have to stand before our God, who is a consuming fire. Now, we'll get into what that means, because we already know we're not going to lose our salvation. We already know that. But the third position is the one that I take. These are, this is, these are warnings to believers, those believers in danger of turning back, apostatizing, going back to, or, uh, to Judaism or something other than Christ, and they face a very serious consequence for their actions. And therefore, the author of Hebrews is warning them. Hebrews 10, 26 through 31 is the most severe of all the warnings and it raises the controversy due to its strong language. Language that is argued cannot be referring to believers. And the only reason we say cannot be referring to believers is because we do not want to even consider that that can be said of believers. But that's really, it, it offends our sensibilities, if you will, as to my understanding of what, what, what my relationship with God is. That I can't fall in those parameters. Well, that's not my position, and here's why. Here's why I believe it's believers. One, I'm going to give you several reasons. One, the use of the pronoun, uh, the, the personal pronoun, we, 
at the very outset, if we go on sinning, if we, what's that mean? The author of the letter of Hebrews includes himself as to the reality of this potential danger. He says, if we, if even me, if I were to do this, if we do this, we got a problem. So that's the first one. Second, he says, sinning willfully. Sinning willfully argues that a person must have the ability to do otherwise. The, the very idea of being sinning with your will, willfully sinning, argues to the reality that that person has the ability to do otherwise. That is to not sin a reality in, that is really foreign to the lost. You're not given a new, you're not a new creature until Christ. Now, can unbelievers not sin? Yes. But they don't have the realization that, that you do once you come to Christ. Because you're made a new creature. You have a nature now that is born again. And I have a capacity to recognize and know this is sin. This is God's will. And I can choose to do this. I can make a choice for good or I can do the bad. That speaks to the willful. Third, the context here, the immediate context, the readers have been referred to this way. In 1010, they are referred to as sanctified. In 1014, they are referred to as perfected for all time. In 1019, they are referred to as brethren. In 1029, they are referred to as sanctified. And in 1030, they are referred to as his people. His people. So what are we talking about? Well, we're talking about believers. We're talking about believers. Fourth, we're told after receiving the knowledge of the truth. You say, well, why the the, the, pastor? Why the the? Why are you doing the the thing? Because that's the article. And what he's talking about is a specific knowledge. The knowledge of the truth. What? A full understanding and embracing in the mind of the saving truth. So after receiving the knowledge of the truth, the specific message... Receiving as well speaks of reception and knowledge here in the Greek is epigenosis rather than gnosis. Epigenosis speaks to a full and complete knowledge. These are people who know that Jesus is the Savior. They've, been, they've received that. That's what we're seeing here. I want to say this, an unbeliever cannot possess the knowledge that is spoken of here. They have no understanding. Romans 3.11 tells us they do not understand. They do not understand. They don't do good. They can't do good. They don't understand. And in 1 Corinthians 2.14, we're told that the natural man cannot understand the things of God because they're spiritually discerned. So to have a, a full knowledge of the truth, we're not talking about lost people. Five, sins is used. Sins, it, it, when we look at, at it here, if we go on sinning willfully after receiving, there remains no more a, a sacrifice for sins. It's in a plural here. And here's the point. For the believer, excuse me, for the unbeliever, the issue is sin. The issue is sin. For the believer, the issue is sins. Sins. State, lost sin condition versus the act of sin. For me, 
The sin issue is settled. It's done as it relates to my standing before God. I'm saved. But the sins that I commit, they're an issue. They're a problem. They can be. We're all going to sin. We're a liar if we say we don't sin. If we, if we say we have no sin, we're a liar and the truth isn't even in us is what, what uh, we're told in 1 John. We're sinners. But we're given the provision in 1 John 1, 9 to confess our sins. He's faithful and just. But what we're talking about here is this willful sinning. Willful sinning against God. That's what we're seeing. Sixth point here, and then we'll move on to the actual uh, the, the, the part here that makes the case for the, the consequences being severe. But the sixth one for why they're a believer is verse 30. For we know him who said, vengeance is mine, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. Here's the issue. The issue in this passage here is of willful sin against God who hates sin. Especially in the lives of his people. His people. Thus, this, the, 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 great, the greater accounting and the warning. See, when we stand before God, we've been born again. We're regenerated. We have the Spirit of God in us. We, we, we stand before Him as those who could have chose to not sin. We're accountable for sin. Now, can that condemn me? No. No. Now, I know where most of you are. Well, not most of you, because some of you have been through this with me before. But the reality is, is most of us think... That, you know, when we get there, it's not a matter of judgment for sin. It's all good. No. It's not what we see even at the Bama Seat Judgment. We're told that we're, we're accounting for that which is good and bad at that judgment. And I'm going to tell you, that which is bad is sin. It's sin. It's not sin that will condemn us. Praise God. Every one of us should say praise God to that. I'm not going to hell for sins once I've trusted Christ. But if I continue willfully sinning against God, there's going to be consequences for that. In my, in my life, but especially in my life going forward with the Lord into that kingdom reality. Now, with that said, let's return to the warning Proper. Let's look at the warning. Here it is boiled down. Willful sin, ongoing willful sin on the part of a believer will be met with certain terrifying judgment at the hands of the living God. That's the warning. That's the warning. We will give an account. The question is, is there, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sin? What are we talking about with that clause? There remains no longer a sacrifice for sins. What, what's, it, what's this mean? Well, here it is it, by way of an answer. Willful sin ongoing has no covering. That is in light of the context which we've just come out of. What's the context? Jesus has already once and for what? All time. One time for all time. Offered himself for our sins. He's done that. He will not nor will there be a sacrifice to pay for sins committed willfully after receiving the knowledge of the truth. That's what he's saying. That's what's in view here. Jesus already died. One time for all time. He's, he's paid the price. Willful sin on the part of believers is not going to be met with another sacrifice 
from the Lord. What's going to be met with is judgment. Not hell, but yet terrifying. And I'm going to tell you something. Oh. It scares me. To know that I sin. And I, sometimes I sin willfully. We all do. And to think that I'm not going to have to stand and answer for that is silly. He already died for my sin. He's not dying again. There's going to be a why, Dan. There's going to be a cost, Dan. You should be here, Dan, but you're not going to be. It scares me. I want us to finish well. I want us all to hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. And you want to know something? We can. We can. But this sin specific of Hebrews, where these believers were going to walk away from Jesus and go into Judaism or, or corrupt it with a faith in Jesus, but yet embrace the law and corrupt the gospel, he says you can't do that. And if you continue in that state, you face a terrifying judgment before your God. It's, it's scary when you think about it. What, what, when we have to stand there before the Lord. You may say, I thought he died because he died for my sins, past, present, and future. I, we all love that one, by the way. Because it's like it's like a license you can carry. He died for my sin, past, present, future. Therefore, if I mess up, no big deal. Well, that's probably true in most senses. When we go out and we fall on our face before the Lord, I don't know, anger gets the best of me in a moment, and I lash out at George over something, and I sin against my brother in that way. I, I can go to the Lord in 1 John 1, 9 and say, Lord, I did this to George. I'm so sorry. I've talked to George and made it right, and we're good. I believe that's covered. I'm washed. I'm clean. That's forgotten. But the idea that I can continue in sins, in sins, just continue on that path and not answer for that, it's not real. It, it, it's not being realistic with what's here. He did die for your sin, past, present, and future. He did. Jesus did. There isn't anything that you've done in the past that you will do presently or can do in the future that will ever separate you from the love of Jesus Christ. What do you say to that? Praise God. That's our reality. I want you to glory in that. Rejoice in that. We all should. We all should. But as it relates only to condemnation, that's hell. That's hell. But for willful sin, in light of the reality that Jesus paid that price once for all, there will be and must be an accounting. The terms, another question, the terms fire and adversaries. Speak of the realities of unbelievers. That, that's, that's for unbelievers, right? Well, yes, it is. But they're also used as, uh, of believers as well. Fire is used of our judgment before the Lord in 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 13. The fire shall reveal the motives. Shall reveal the heart. And there will be a suffering of loss. At the Bema. There will be reward. Great reward there. A lot of little brothers and sisters in Christ. Are going to be rewarded greatly. You're going to get reward. For stuff you probably don't even know that you've done. And you know what? Most of the rewards we get. Are going to be that kind of a deal. I think. It's going to be when we're not doing it about self. Or anything other than for the Lord. And the Lord's keeping track of that stuff. Because that's where he shines, not Dan Larimore, not you, not anybody else. That's where Jesus shines. 
when it just flows out of a regenerated heart for the love of Jesus, that's going to bring reward. But then that, that bay mother is going to also be a fire involved that reveals exactly what is pure and what is straw and wood and hay. What's of precious stones? What can endure the fire? So it's used fire. Enemies is even used of believers because we're told friendship with the world is hostility toward God. And the idea is you are an enemy of God. You can enter into a, a, a state as an adversary to the Lord. James 4.4. 4. You're at hostility with, the, with God when you, when, you're, when you love the world. When you have friendship with the world. So the warning, the warning is for all believers to understand and specifically that we might understand the seriousness of willful sin. Sin that is met with serious consequences at the hands of our God. Now the second part of this warning that establishes this truth and that's the rationale. The rationale for this. Here's, here's some, the rationale. Look at 28 through 29. And then again, you have to realize he's writing to what believers? Primarily, these are Hebrew believers. That, the, the Hebrew letter to the Hebrews. Hebrews is what we have. Anyone, what we have reading it here, anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much severer punishment do you think he will deserve who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has regarded as unclean the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has insulted the Spirit of grace? The author takes the reader here, when we look at these verses, what he does is he takes us back to the Old Testament. And he does so pointedly because he's writing to primarily Jewish believers. And he takes them back to the law. And he says, let's just consider the law. If you think this is harsh, that God would do this and warn believers this way, well, let's go back to the Old Testament economy, what they, what they went faced. And what he takes, he takes them back there. And he, and he makes the case for the necessity of such a judgment as a consequence of willful sin. Transgress, transgress the law, and on the basis of two or three witnesses, you were put to death under the law without mercy. And that's, quite a, that's quite a judgment. You're put to death. Pure justice. That's what, that's what it is. Transgress the law, you're put to death. On the basis of two to three witnesses, you're put to death. And that's what we see here. That's what we have in that verse 29. Here's the rationale for such a severe judgment. For those who sin willfully after receiving the knowledge of the truth. If there was such a judgment meted... Now think about it. If there was such a judgment... That severe of a judgment that was meted out as it related to an inferior, inferior covenant. Because we've already made a whole case that the, the Levitical system, the law, could never do what Jesus did. So if, if there was such a judgment that was meted out as it related to an inferior covenant, how much more severe as it relates to Willful transgression of the new and superior covenant founded upon the very blood of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. That's the rationale. To do so, to do so, if we do that, you're in, we're indicted on three charges, if you will. Three charges. One, we're told in these verses... We're showing no regard for the person of the Son of God. It is to trample underfoot the Son of God. When we decide willfully, again, willfully, to sin, we are basically stepping on our Lord and what He did. Second, we show no, the second indictment, we show no regard for the work of the Son. 
regarded as unclean the blood of the covenant by which we were or was he was excuse me sanctified he was sanctified so what are we talking about when when we when we sin willfully we minimize the work that Jesus has done he's given us the ability to do good we're no longer that person before the Lord. We're the person after the Lord. And that looks a certain way. And if it doesn't, and it's willful, if it's willful, we are disregarding his work. We are showing no regard for his person. And third, we're showing no regard for the Holy Spirit of grace. Willful sin is to willfully insult the Spirit of of God. This is a hard one uh, because you get into this sins of omission and commission and all this stuff. And I find this to be very tough ground, to be honest with you, because it's, it, you know, to hide behind, I didn't know I was sinning. Well, the problem with that is we all have what? After Jesus. We have the Holy Spirit of God indwelling us. And we're told that the ministry of the Holy Spirit is to do what? One of the things. To convict us. To make us aware. And I'm going to tell you something. God does not want us to sin. So do you not think that the Holy Spirit isn't going to convict us? I'm telling you, most of our sin is willful. We can get caught up in the passions, and there, there I give ground. You know what I mean? We're in the moment. Back to George and I's fight. We just got mad. Something lit us off, and we got mad at each other. Passions just caused, you know what I mean? The human nature caused it. But it's not like I sat at home and said, I'm going to go find George, and I am going to lambast him. And I'm just going to make his life miserable well that's willful this just happened you know even in, in Galatia it talks about coming alongside and, and your brother who is fallen or taken by sin it just he fell into it it's not his character willful sin on the part of a believer would be uh, in staying with the analogy of a hot tempered person is one who it's not out of character. It just happens all the time, all the time. They're pugnacious by nature. They're fighters. They're angry. They're mean. They're born again. Are they? I don't know. But if they trusted Christ, if they truly trust God, they're saved. But that's a problem. That's a problem. That's willful. They're in sin. And, they're, and, and, and if they're not going to deal with that, they're doing these things. They're showing no regard for the Son of God. They're showing no regard for the work that He's done in their life. They're showing no regard for the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit by grace that's been given because of Jesus Christ to each one of us. They're disregarding all of that. And there's an accounting, an accounting that takes place. Now, I know when you look at these charges, most of us would say, I'll never, I, I would never do that. And I pray that that would be our heart. Every one of us would want to say that. I would never do that. But the reality is, is we do. We do sometimes. Every time we choose to be, to enter into willful sin, this is how God sees it. That's how he sees it. And his call is all that matters in the end really is the final point part three of this warning that teaches the seriousness of willful sin and its certain consequences is the basis of it look at verses 30 through 31 for we know him who said and that's important too we know him who said who's he talking about he's talking about god we know him we're talking about a believer here we know him we know him and he said what? Vengeance is mine. I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge who? 
His people. His people. It is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. The basis, the basis of this warning, this, this severe judgment is God himself. What do you mean? I mean, his justice demands it. It demands it. We've been given too much in Jesus. He's better what? Than everything. <laughs> he saved us. And when we enter into sin, that for this, these readers, sin specific, apostatize, go back, there's real consequences. And when we sin in willful ways, ongoingly, you're, you're kidding yourself if you think you're going to stand at the judgment seat and it's going to be a, a little reel to reel that says, you are born again and it's wonderful and you get in and on. Here's your lollipops and go on. I mean, praise God, it's going to be a wonderful experience. But for some of us, there are going to be moments of loss. We're going to have to account for deeds done, whether good or bad. The good ones, they translate right and transfer right into the millennial experience. The rewards, the, 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 the presence of or, or the, the intimacy of our fellowship with Jesus is affected in that experience. The, the, the responsibility he gives us. And, and, and then the word is gives us. See, we don't like responsibility on this side of glory. But when we get on that side of glory, we want all that we can get. Because we're doing it for Jesus. We're equipped for it. In, and it's living for him. It's ruling, reigning with him. But, but he's the reason that he has to judge this way. Because he's a holy God. And he saved us to be better. He's not going to send us to hell, but there will be accounting for willing sin. For if we sin willfully after that, we've received the knowledge of the truth. There remaineth no more sacrifice for sin, but a certain fearful looking forward to judgment and fiery indignation, which can devour the adversaries. And then we're told in 31, it is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. We don't want to face our God in judgment because we've decided I'm going to sin if I want to. I'm just willfully going to sin against him. There will be an accounting. There's a cost. And we'll look more at that, what that looks like. We have been through the letter. But I want to reconcile this because I think you need it. It's in the discussion. Because I've been I've been all over this and I say that. Not as a pastor teacher, but as a believer just like you. This passage is marked in my very first uh, reading of the entire Word of God, where I read the Bible from Genesis all the way through Revelation. My mom gave me and I read a, a King James Version, a Thompson Chain reference version of the Bible. It had the, the index column on it where you could find the books and I, I had gotten right with the Lord he turned my life around and I said I'm going to read the Bible cover to cover and I read it in the King James and this passage first time through freaked me out because I saw it that he died for me. I'm saved. But I can sin willfully. And I can do these things. And if, if I'm going to live that way. I have to account for that. You have to account for those things. And, it, and it's, it's scary. It, it's a scary thing. But. Praise God. We have. 1 John 1.9. If we confess our sin, our sins, he is faithful and just to do what? He'll cleanse us of our sins. Amen. All our unrighteousness. And we're back to a clean slate. We go forward. 
I don't know necessarily, I'm not gonna sit up here and pretend like I know how all of it works out. How, you know, can I confess first John? But I know this, we can't play games with God. Like he can't see my heart. You see what I'm saying? You can't just play your theological trump card. Like, oh, here's my club. I'm going to throw the club out on this and take that. You know, here's, I'm going to meet that with, with this. No, you confess because there's an acknowledgement in the heart, an agreement with God. That's what confess means, agreeing with God that this was sin. There's a, a repentance that's taking place, a contrition, and he forgives it. He forgives it. It's gone. So that's there. There's hope for forgiveness. There's hope for forgiveness in our sin. There is. There is. And praise God for it. And then one brother told me, because I was all shook up about this, and I was like, you know, how do we change the character of our judgment if we've got willful sin, you know, how does this work? Is this sin specific just for, you know, going away from Christ? Because some people take that position that the, only that's in view here. But, it, it, but he says sins plural. You know, it, it, the idea is willful sinning. And he said this, he said, all I can tell you, Dan, and I've been over this too. He said that. We can change the character or the complexion of our judgment by how we judge others. The same standard by which we judge others will be the same standard by which we're judged. So if we're harsh and we can't minister grace and mercy in our lives to other people and understand the human condition and their need for, for repentance and and uh, to, to seek forgiveness and, and be compassionate and, and try to help them in that. If all of we can be is hard nose and say, look at him, he got what he, you know, you got that kind of an attitude. That's why we'll come back and haunt us. But if we're mercy, you show mercy, you shall be shown mercy. <laughs> so don't go out of here totally freaked out. <laughs> But I pray that you, you're, I pray that there's a sense of reality to our understanding of sin in our life. And I'm not talking sin out there. I'm talking our sin and what we do with it and we don't do with it and why we sin and if it's willful and what we're all about because there is a consequence. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, uh, even for this most of sobering of passages in this letter. I pray, Lord, that uh, the, the message here would come home to each of our hearts, not in order to induce an ongoing terror uh, in our hearts, but uh, an awareness that there is an accounting, even for the believing, if we're going to willfully sin against the Lord. I, I pray, Lord, for each one of us in, in, a, in Prairie Bible, at Prairie Bible, but all, all of us as believers, Lord, that our heart would be to finish in such a way and to live, live, I should say, in such a way that we finish well in the end. Lord, may we all finish and be met a joy of Jesus Christ. Bless each one, Lord, for being out today. I pray that your Holy Spirit would take the words proclaimed here and, and bring them home to each heart. And uh, I just pray you bless the week out ahead of us. Help us count wherever we're at for you, Lord. And uh, I pray for uh, Mr. Bauer coming next week. I pray that he'd be coming with a message that you've actually uh, put upon his heart to be preached to your people here at Prairie. But bless now and keep us. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.